Thank you. Hi, everyone. So last talk of the day, I'll try and stick to my 15 minutes and um, give you the lowdown on the Mellon governance model. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, we founded Mellonport just over two years ago, and we've spent the last couple of years building what we were mandated to build, the Mellon Protocol, which is a protocol for asset management, which uh, is the lead into on-chain asset management and allows fund managers entering our protocol to predefine a set of rules by which they can operate, technology regulate their funds. So you can predefine things like which exchanges your fund can trade with, what your asset universe is, who's allowed to invest in your fund, uh, what your management and performance fees are, and so on and so forth. And the smart contract takes care of operating and distributing the fees and so on and, and all the accounting um, and the rule sets. So, um, so, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. We're here to talk about what happens next. So we always said from the very beginning that Mellon was intended to be a decentralized protocol. Um, and we, from the, from the get-go, said that we would be winding down Mellonport at the end of the two-year project, which is coming up very soon. Um, so how do we get rid of Mellonport and let a protocol take off on its own? Um, so we've been spending a lot of time in the last few months and weeks thinking about that. And there's three main things that we have um, addressed. The first is uh, trying to figure out how to maximize the network effect. The second is providing good economic incentives to all the stakeholders in the system. And the third is the future governance and maintenance from now once Mellonport steps back as uh, the company behind it all. So um, we're gonna start off quickly over uh, with a quick overview on how to maximize the network effect. So there's a couple of ways uh, we did this, and um, one thing that we um, one thing that we realized when we in you know in the last few months was we had a lot of projects coming to us and saying, okay, wow, we really like the infrastructure you've built, and now we want to you know build use cases on top of that. So we had you know people from the insurance space, the VC space, saying because we've sp we've focused on on hedge funds, but you could use this asset management infrastructure for a lot of different use cases. And all these different projects came along and said, we're going to do our ICO, and then we're going to build on top of you. And then I was thinking, oh my god, then we're going to have a gazillion tokens in this ecosystem. And that's not very practical from a user experience or a cost experience. The whole point is we're trying to reduce barriers to entry. Um, so I think that isolating these different projects with different economic um, token models can be inefficient. And the, the one, of the one of the things we've tried to do is create synergies so that we can also um, have scale, but also attract a lot of um, interesting developers um, into our into our ecosystem. Anyway, so uh, one of the ways we did this was um, by opening up Melon. So what I mean by that is we now, um, from the m from the point that we launched to Mainnet, we will now be um, allowing developers to apply for grants through the Melon Improvement Proposals. So we had a lot of great ideas brought to us from our community in the last few months. A lot of them were not exactly on our roadmap, or at least not top priority. So we have um, um, created a MIP uh, repository in GitHub where they have been documented and where people will be able to earn Melon token in future for completing those MIPs. We've also uh, opened up Melon in the sense that we're allowing projects to build applications on Melon and make funding requests to the future governance system. So instead of running their own ICO and having their own independent token, they can just uh, request from the inflated pool a bunch of Melon token in order to fund their development for the, for the, for the, for the project. And uh, thirdly, we've allowed projects with existing, um, who may already have existing tokens, but see some sense and synergy in collaborating with us and vice versa to do a token swap or some kind of merger request, which again reduces the need for multiple tokens. So that's, um, that's part one. The second thing that we thought about for, um, for that is providing good economic incentives. And this is really important because um, when thinking about designing the token economics, you need to really think about all the stakeholders in the system, and this doesn't always get thought of enough. So in our case, we have the um, users, so that would be the fund managers and the investors in the funds. We have the developers and the future maintainers of the protocol, and we have the token holders. And what we wanted to do is design a token model that looks after the token 
holders through, desi through design, so um, links the value of the token to the usage on the network, uh, or the purchasing power of the token, I should say, to the value of the network, to the, to the usage of the network. And also, um, but also, um, uh, yeah, so we m we've managed to do that. And how we've managed to do that is, um, is I'll go through this right now. We designed something called the Melon Engine. So this is as you use the um, Melon smart contracts on, on Ethereum, you will obviously have to pay gas to Ethereum, but also you are subject to an asset management gas on some of our protocol functions, only, only three to be specific. And basically what happens is we use the, the same unit accounting for gas, but we have a melon gas price as opposed to uh, an Ethereum gas price. So the, the, the gas gets collected in Ether and goes to the melon engine. The melon engine then um, creates a, one, a unidirectional market to buy melon um, at a premium. And basically this creates a consistent demand for the melon token, which is linked to the usage of the protocol. And as it acquires the, the melon, the, the smart contract simultaneously burns it. So we have a sort of uh, buy and burn or, s or a sync model as well. So this addresses the velocity problem as well, because the sync model uh, reduces the need for, uh, you know, uh, uh, reduces the uh, circulation problem that could ensue if uh, you didn't have that sync module. Um, and we think that um, that provides a good basis for, um, for linking the token to the, to the usage. Um, so I'm going to go on now to governance and uh, maintenance, which is really why um, most of us are here. Um, and when we approached the governance part of our um, work, there's really three questions we wanted to answer how we're going to do it, uh, why, we're gonna do why we're doing this, and what exactly is it. So I'm going to start with the why. So um, why do we need to design uh, a governance system? What are the goals that we want to achieve from this? And we really had three main goals. The first was preserving the integrity of the network. The second was maximizing user adoption. And the third was fostering innovation and creating network attractiveness. So basically, how we've approached this is by making a governance model which is very user-centric uh, and technically skilled. And you'll remember at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned all the stakeholders. Um, we can afford to do this because we've looked after token holders' needs and requirements through the token design model. Um, and actually, what we felt when we were looking at our governance was that the underrepresented stakeholders in the system and probably the ones with the most to lose or the most at stake were the users themselves who are putting real money and trusting the protocol with setting up funds and investing in those funds. So, um, so how we've done this is uh, by designing something called the Mellon Council, which will be unveiled soon. And the Mellon Council is basically comprised of two types of members. The Mellon Technical Council, which is a, a group of technically skilled people that initially Mellonport will uh, select, but after that will grow by consensus. And the second uh, group of people are what we refer to as MEBs, or Mellon Exposed Businesses. So these will basically be um, users of the Mellon Protocol, or people who can prove that they have significant assets or significant usage of the protocol or even business that's orientated around that. And these uh, representatives on the council will be self-elected. So they will organize themselves and they will elect representatives to sit on the Mellon Council and lobby push for their requirements. So for example, if security is like their number one concern, they'll raise that to the Mellon Council and insist that the technically skilled people on the council are fo focusing on security first and foremost. Or if there's an additional feature that they want to see with utmost importance, they'll say, look guys, if you want us to keep using this protocol and you want the usage to grow, you need to really do this and that. Um, so, so it's kind of like a, a consortium-like model. Um, it expan expands by cons consensus. The Mellon Technical Council will be compensated through this inflation pool that I represented, so a fixed amount of annual inflation will be distributed amongst the Mellon Technical Council for their um, efforts. Um, and the identities of the Mellon Council will be known. So what are the responsibilities going to be for the Mellon Council? Um, 
The first is looking after protocol upgrades. Um, the second, even though the, the Mellon te uh, Technical Council will, um, will push upgrades, it's actually really up to the users uh, to opt in to the upgrade. So we never force an upgrade on the user, it's always an opt-in. Um, the second is resource allocation. So there will be a fixed amount of 300,000 melons created each year through the inflation mechanism. And um, a, a, a part of that will be to compensate the technical council, but most of that will be to grant developers for melon improvement proposals and other projects who are building on melons. So the council will vote on how to allocate those resources. And the third thing is um, adjusting the network parameters. So we don't uh, expect this to be um, needed very often, but um, the, the asset management gas will be fixed by us initially, um, and it's set so that it's so low it shouldn't need to be adjusted very often, but in the case that there's an extreme ETH melon volatility or even melon USD volatility, um, then it may be the case that there will be moments that we need to adjust it, or in the case that there is an e a huge spike in usage on the network, which was unforeseen. Um, so I think I have covered most of the, the, p the points I wanted to make, but there is one small <laughs> announcement that I wanted to make before we close for today and go for drinks. Um, I just wanted to announce that the Mellon um, Council, and this is the first time we say this publicly, uh, will be powered by Aragon OS. <laughs> We're very, very happy about this. We will be releasing more details of this in coming days. Um, but maybe just quickly, um, as a, as a teaser, we'll uh, share with you that the Mellon Council DAO uh, will be able to do the following things. Uh, we'll be able to invite new Mellon Technical Council, Council or MEB, so Mellon Council members in and also to vote them out. Um, the, the voting will be, um, will enable voting on the AMGU price, that's the Asset, mas asset Management Gas Unit price. Um, it will um, involve the voting on protocol ENS subdomains <laughs> and, um, and also on the protocol parameters. So we're very happy to uh, announce that. It's been a pleasure to work with the Aragon team on that. And I've personally played around it as we've done some internal simulations um, at work. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so I look forward to showing you more on that in the next few weeks with our team. And um, I'll let us close on that and, um, and wish everyone a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.